Ladies and gentlemen, we are uh, getting closer and closer to air show time. We'd like to welcome all the uh, late arrivals to the airport. And uh, once again, to say on behalf of Rear Admiral Al Newman, Commander of Fighter, Early, uh, Fighter Airborne Early Warning Wing Pacific, and Captain Gary Hughes, the commanding officer of NAS Miramar, we welcome you to Fighter Town, USA. Our air show will be beginning shortly after noon time today. As the late arrivals have come onto the airport, uh, we're going to tell you again that we have uh, got airplanes all over the place for you to look at and for you to enjoy. These airplanes uh, represent the most modern of military equipment, and some of the privately owned warbirds represent the air power from the era of World War II and Korea. Would you please stand and honor America as Miss Linda Zavara sings our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets rick bombs bursting That our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave? Oh, the land.
Well, well, let's see. You've probably been in line to get on here. See the folks in the front row. You've probably been in line since about 6 o'clock this morning. You probably got onto the airport about 9. Set the chairs down. It's now just a few minutes after 12. Would you like to see us put these runways to good use? All right. If that's what you'd like, if you've got long glasses, you can look out to the right side. You see we've got a bunch of airplanes down the right. All right. And for all the folks down on the right side, you look up here to the left, and by golly, we got a tomcat sitting up here about ready to pounce, sharpening his claws, ready to snarl and growl and make a lot of noise. Watson have tagged their KA-7 tanker, flown by Lieutenant Cross, and in this simulated tanking pass could be taking on thousands of pounds of fuel. Lieutenant Engelman, in his KA-7, is sitting on the wing. Now from VF-126, the bandits, left and right, Two of the well-known and easily recognized aircraft from the movie Top Gun are taking position for an opposing takeoff. Lieutenant Rick Ice Berg in his A4F Skyhawk and Lieutenant Commander George Walrus Geo in his F5E Tiger. For those of you who have seen the movie Top Gun, the Skyhawk is the airplane flown by Top Gun instructor Callsign Jester. The Tiger is one of the planes that stood in for the Soviet MiGs. And by the way, if you're not familiar with the movie Top Gun, where have you been? These airplanes will be back in just a little while. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Fort Worth Division of General Dynamics proudly presents this flight demonstration of the F-16N Fighting Falcon. The F-16 is a multi-role tactical fighter able to carry out an air-to-ground attack mission when required. The F-16 designed in 1972 as a simple lightweight fighter. Three years later, in 75, the United States Air Force announced the initial purchase of 105 airplanes, and four European countries announced the F-16 would replace their older aircraft. By the end of 1976, orders had topped 1,000 aircraft. And to date, the U.S. Air Force has announced its intentions of purchasing 2,700 F-16 Fighting Falcons, and now the Navy has ordered n models specifically for use right here at Fighter Town, USA. This is one of the airplanes that has recently been purchased by Top Gun. There are 4,200 orders worldwide. The first Air Force F-16 unit became operational in the winter of 1979 with the 388th Tactical Fighter Wing at Hill Air Force Base in Utah. The demonstration you'll see today will graphically illustrate the power, the speed, the agility, and maneuverability of the General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon. Commander Dave Palmer, F-16 program test pilot, will fly the same program he presented at the Paris Air Show late last spring. 
At this time, Commander Palmer is completing the cockpit check this fly-by-wire airplane. Once he's satisfied his aircraft is ready, he will advance the throttle on the single General Electric F-110 turbofan to 100% and begin his takeoff roll. After a few seconds, he'll rotate the throttle outboard, light the afterburner, and lift off at 155 knots. He will then fly the F-16 through a low-speed loop. Watch out to the left and listen for the power to come up. setting up for an agility demonstration. From the left, the F-16 will approach at 350 knots, about 400 miles per hour. Approaching the center point, Commander Palmer will commence a maximum performance turn away from the spectator area. Then rolling hard right, he will extend the speed brakes and pass us from the opposite direction at minimum airspeed. went into the cockpit design to get the canopy shape instrument layout and seat angle just right to produce the most efficiency with the least fatigue. The pilot sits in a zero altitude and zero airspeed ejection seat, reclined to a 30 degree angle to better distribute g-forces in a 9g pull. The pilot uses a side stick wrist controller, similar to those used in spacecraft. All flight controls are manipulated by a sophisticated electrical fly-by-wire system, enabling the Fighting Falcon to respond more accurately to pilot commands. Based on a digital computer, the Westinghouse multi-mode pulse Doppler radar has a range of 160 miles. It can look down at a target and eliminate ground clutter. The F-16's armament includes an M61 20mm cannon, which can be fired either in the Sparrow in the uh, snapshot mode or with optical lead computing. Up to six sidewinders, cluster bombs, flare pods, air-to-service missiles, paved penny laser pods, laser-guided bombs, and electro-optical weapons. The Fighting Falcon is 47 feet 8 inches long, 
16 and a half feet high and 32 feet 10 inches wide over the sidewinders on the wingtips. It climbs at 42,000 feet per minute. At 36,000 feet, its top speed is Mach 2.2, over twice the speed of sound. From the Fort Worth division of General Dynamics, Dave Palmer and the F-16 Fighting Falcon. How'd you like that? To your right, an E-2C Hawkeye from VAW-110 is taking the runway. The E-2C Hawkeye is a sophisticated radar platform that is the long-range eyes of the fleet. The Hawkeye joined the fleet in 1964. It's equipped with five tons of electronic goodies, the most obvious of which is the enormous surveillance radar disc the Hawkeye carries on a pylon, like a 24-foot diameter umbrella. In addition to the surveillance radar, an IFF identification friend or foe system is housed in the radome. It carries an air data computer and a carrier aircraft inertial navigation system. The main system can detect airborne targets in a land clutter environment at ranges of over 230 miles. It can provide automatic detection and tracking over land or water, with simultaneous surveillance of both air and surface traffic, displayed separately if required. The data processing gear can track automatically and simultaneously more than 600 targets and control more than 40 airborne intercepts. Its passive detection system automatically detects the presence, direction, and identity of any traffic in a high signal density environment. The PDS alerts the operators of the presence and identity of any electronic intrusion at distances of 500 miles. The Hawkeye's own electronic countermeasures ensure its effectiveness in the face of hostile jamming. And it does it all with a five-man crew. Our demonstration Hawkeye is from Carrier Airborne Early Warning Squadron 110, the Firebirds. The crew members, Lieutenant Chuck Lefever, Lieutenant Jeff Taylor, and operating the radar systems today is Chief Ike Icona. The commanding officer of the AW-110 is Commander Mitch Highfill. Our Hawkeye has made a normal field takeoff and is now circling around out to the far left for a carrier break. They'll be coming in, you'll see the, uh, both the engines smoking pretty good as they're going to have it just about wide open. They're going to try and do this about as fast as they can, coming into the break from the left at 1,100 feet. And once again, this is the kind of approach they'd be making to the deck of a carrier. And we'll say that our aircraft carrier deck and the arresting gear is slightly to the left of the center point. From 275 knots, now the aircraft has been slowed to 105 knots, the airspeed at which it would be approaching and landing on the carrier. If you look out to the left side, Notice that the aircraft is in a constant rate of descent and a constant rate of turn. This is the normal approach to the carrier deck. This will be a slow speed flyby in the carrier landing configuration at 105 knots. You'll notice that the gear is out, the flaps are out, and also if you look behind the airplane you can see the arresting hook is down. This pass will be at 200 feet above the deck. Approaching the end of the carrier deck, our pilots will receive a simulated wave off and will accelerate away from the deck in a missed approach. What you're watching now is the approach on a high obstacle minimum ground roll landing. This is a very, very steep angle of descent and you can see the nose is down but they've got to slow this airplane up they're going to be landing over an assumed obstacle of let's say 50 feet and stopping the airplane as quickly as possible once they land the airplane planted on the runway they've got to shove the yoke all the way forward cross the squat switch in the nose gear and go beta on the propellers reversing the propellers for that minimum ground roll a nice flare there's the touchdown yoke forward now the nose gear is crushed and deep beta and let's watch how quickly they can stop those propellers reversed, of course, we can back the airplane up. You want to put it in a real tight parking space on a Saturday night date, well, here's how it's done. Watch.
if you'd worked your way into a very short runway at an airport and you didn't want to uh, waste any, you want to back up as far as you can, that's the way you do it. You reset the takeoff configuration up on the power, come off on the brakes, and now watch a minimum deck run, mango, maximum angle of climb takeoff to 1,600 feet. Hauling it back, lifting it off, staying in ground effect, make sure it's still flying. Let's get the gear up and I'll watch this climb. these performers, because of the fact that you know, these are lying military pilots we're talking about, they aren't going to get to come back here and shake your hands. You know, their job is done. they got to put the airplanes back and do a post-flight inspection. But they can certainly see you wave. You know, now we got 400,000 people here today. You got a hat or you got a handkerchief or something. Now, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Wait, wait, just wait. Right now, they're trying to keep the airplane in the middle of the runway. Let's just wait until they get the aircraft stopped. Now, once they have it stopped, let's see if they turn it around here. If they turn it around and face us, yeah, they're going to. I want everybody to wave. I want to see everybody waving. Go ahead, everybody, give a great big wave. Now let's see if they're watching. Well, it's a flash of the landing lights and there they're waving back to you. Look at that. I hope you notice they got the dish turning too. They got the big radio on top of the airplane turning as well. Isn't that some? Well, that's the way they store it on the carrier, and I think that dome comes down hydraulically something like 18 inches so they can make it on the hangar deck. Isn't that pretty? How'd you like that? Well, once again, our thanks to the Firebirds, our pilots, Lieutenant Chuck Lefevre, Lieutenant Jeff Taylor, Chief Ike Icona, and uh, Commanding Officer Commander Mitch Highfill. Fightertown USA Air Show 87, Miramar NAS. We're here with uh, Captain Jeff Tice with the F-111A fighter bomber. Jeff, will you tell us about this airplane? Well, this particular airplane is the F-111A that's uh, nicknamed the Aardvark. It's not an official nickname. It's a designation that the guys who fly it gave it a long, long time ago. Mainly, it's called an Aardvark simply because it's got a real long nose, as you can see, and it hugs the ground at night. An Aardvark is a nocturnal animal, and this airplane is designed to fly at night, low-level, all-weather terrain following radar. And so that's what we use it for, night, low-level bombing. And that's how most of the time you'd think guys got, gave it that name from that, okay? What's the, uh, what's the combat history on the airplane? This particular airplane was built in 1967, and it's, sent, it's seen a little bit of usage in Vietnam in the late 60s and the early 70s. They took uh, a group of F-111s into Vietnam, uh, and then there was some initial problems with the aircraft, and they solved most of those, and, uh, and so it ended up its history in Vietnam around about 1971. It's the last time I think they used them in Vietnam. And what, what's the current job for the aircraft? Right now, it's still night low-level bombing. That's what we do with it right now. Uh, this type of airframe, airframe, of course, went to Libya for the Libya raid and went downtown to Tripoli. Um, right now, I am in the training squadron, the 389th Tactical Fighter Training Squadron, and we train guys how to fly this. They come right out of pilot training, and then they come to us, and we teach them how to fly a fighter and teach them how to be fighter pilots. That's our job. Okay, where are you based? We're based at Mount Home, Idaho. And uh, how many airplanes are currently left in service, F-111s? I think, I think there's 135 still left in service. Most of them are based overseas at RAF Lake and Heath and RAF Upper Hayford. There's uh, two bases here in the States. One is at uh, Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico and, of course, Mountain Home, Idaho is the other one. So there's only four places they got them left. What, uh, what do we have on the horizon that uh, can ultimately replace this airplane or do the same job it can? Right now, there isn't anything, to my knowledge. There, uh, there's lots of things in plan and the technology that we have today, of course, course, we could easily replace the airframe, but again, you're talking a money situation. Nobody really knows. They're modifying uh, F-15s uh, to become what's known as the Strike Eagle, an F-15E, and it'll be uh, sort of an interim until they follow on with some other technology. Uh, you can always say that, yeah, maybe the stealth technology will take over. We don't know. It's uh, one of those things. But the F-111s uh, that we have left now, then uh, these are it at the moment. These are it. They stopped producing them in 1974. Uh, I'll probably be retired before this airplane is, you know, there's no doubt about that. 
Okay, thank you, Captain Jeff Tice, uh, Captain uh, of the F-111A. Okay, thanks a lot. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I do want you to look down to the left side again. That beastly looking airplane all the way down there looks kind of nasty. Well, that's a Marine Corps airplane, that's why it looks nasty. That's the AV-8B Harrier, an advanced version of the British Aerospace Harrier. This is the airplane that has come to be known as the Jump Jet. The design dates back to the late 50s when British engineers were given the task of designing a tactical fighter around a very powerful Bristol BS-53 turbofan, which was created to provide an aircraft with enough power to ascend vertically on jet blast alone. In mid-1960, Hawker Siddeley Kestrel, its original name, first flew in hovering flight, accomplished by directing the force of a single jet engine downward via four movable nozzles, two under each wing. After a multitude of engineering changes in April of 69, renamed the Harrier, it became RAF operational. And it was about that time that the Marine Corps placed an initial order for 12 airplanes for test and flight evaluation. The Marine Corps was the first to exploit the helicopter for tactical warfare in Southeast Asia. And the idea of combining vertical takeoff and landing possibilities with a tactical firepower and speed of a jet aircraft raised some exciting possibilities. The Harrier is the only operational free world vertical or short takeoff and landing fighter bomber. The Harrier is now in use on the East Coast, West Coast, and overseas, providing the Marine riflemen with fast reaction and close air support. The AV-8B Harrier incorporates a single fan jet engine and four rotatable exhaust nozzles to achieve vertical flight. Unlike a conventional jet, the exhaust nozzles are located on both sides of the aircraft and are controlled by a lever in the cockpit. When operated by the pilot, the nozzles can be moved from the horizontal position to the vertical position in less than one second. Controllability during hover flight is provided by reaction control ducts at the wingtips, at the nose, and at the tail of the aircraft. These ducts are mechanically connected to the flight controls and are pressurized when the four nozzles are moved down. The engine is manufactured by Rolls-Royce and can develop in excess of 21,500 pounds of thrust. The aircraft is capable of attaining speeds from zero to in excess of 600 miles per hour and delivers a full spectrum of conventional weapons. Today, the Marine Corps presents a demonstration of the Harrier's performance capabilities. The sequence of events will include a short takeoff requiring less than 200 feet of roll, a high G brake turn executed at approximately seven times normal gravity, a vertical landing followed by a vertical takeoff into a climb showing both the tremendous power of the engine and controllability provided by reaction controls at slow speeds and a vertical landing that will conclude the Harrier demonstration. Before you at this time, the aircraft has position for a short takeoff. Using this takeoff technique, the speed and runway required may be as low as 50 knots and less than 200 feet. This allows the pilot flexibility when considering the runway available and aircraft weight. Our pilot is Captain J.D. Downey, flying Nightmares, VMA-1513 at MCAS Yuma. Their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Billy D. McMillan. You want loud? You got loud. Listen. to demonstrate its turn capability. The Harrier is capable of quick acceleration to speeds in excess of 600 miles an hour near the ground. By the use of nozzle deflection or thrust vectoring, the aircraft can turn in a shorter distance. When thrust vectoring is used in aerial combat, there is no tactical aircraft that can remain behind the AV-8B Harrier if the pilot doesn't want him there. Let's watch out for the right side for this high G brake turn. short takeoff and landing ability allows the Harrier to operate from damaged airfields, roads, fields, small ships, and to 72-foot square pads in close proximity to friendly forces, thereby providing the Marine riflemen with rapid reaction close air support. Now, I told you that this is a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. You have seen the short takeoff. Moments from now, you'll see the vertical takeoff. 
In just a moment, the sound level will be so intense that there is no way that you'll be able to hear me speaking above the roar of the engine. The sound will reach 110 decibels. If you're smart, you will hold your ears and not take the full blast of the sound. It can destroy your hearing. You will watch a vertical landing and a vertical takeoff. Watch. of it. See, that's a vertical landing. Now you can do the vertical takeoff. So he goes through the cockpit check right now. And what you watch, you listen as he comes up on the power. He's going to lift the airplane vertically off the ground. Once he's clear of the ground, he'll accelerate away from the area, simultaneously retracting the landing gear. Let's watch now as he prepares for liftoff and the noise level again will approach 110 dB. Busting their humps out here for you today, and 
if you've enjoyed what they've done, see, they'd like to have you wave to them. That's the sort of the way, you know, you say, yeah, we love what you've been doing. They can't hear you applaud and yell and scream, but they can sure see you wave. So as uh, Captain Downey's coming around the pattern right now, he's going to come back into a hover out in front of us here. He'll probably turn the airplane around and face us. And if he sees you waving, maybe he'll do something so you'll, uh, he'll, you'll know that uh, he's watching and he can see you. Let's just watch him as he comes around from the left side. He's got it slowed down again. And I have an idea, rather than just rolling onto a landing here, he may, uh, may come back into a hover out in front of you. And if he does that, and he turns the plane around so he's facing you and he can see you, I want to see everybody here waving. You know, hold, your, hold one ear. You'll have one good ear when you get home today. I want to see everybody waving, and we'll see if uh, Captain Downey can do something for you, if he can wave back to you or something, so you'll know that he sees you. Yeah, I'm right. He's going to bring it back into a hover out in front of us here. All right, let's watch now. that whoa the aircraft used today is a standard av8b harrier designed for military combat operations the maneuvers performed are typical of those used routinely during tactical employment by the av8b that concludes the harrier aerial demonstration As the Harrier's taxiing out of the way down to the right side, perhaps the greatest threat to the free movement of shipping in the world's oceans is the attack submarine. The submarine threat poses a substantial threat to carrier battle groups as well. The carrier anti-submarine warfare team is prepared to meet that threat head on. First intelligence services and other Navy assets alert the ship's air wing that an enemy submarine may be in the area. And the sophisticated S-3 Viking aircraft is immediately launched and sent to the area. Dropping a pattern of sensitive sound monitoring sonobuoys, the S-3 detects the sub and marks the area. As the computer systems aboard the Viking analyze the faint underwater sounds and its crew establishes the critical communication links to ships in the area, the SH-3 Sea King anti-submarine helicopter, like one approaching from the left, is directed to the area of the submarine. The Sea King will immediately dis deploy its unique dipping sonar, perhaps the sensor most feared by submariners. Quickly gaining contact on the evasive submarine, the Sea King can now direct other Vikings or Sea Kings in their delivery of torpedoes, sealing the submarine's fate. The 
shuttle boy you see off the bottom of the airplane, the aircraft, the SH-38 Sea King is one of the Navy's largest helicopters. At 21,000 pounds, it performs all-weather battle group anti-submarine warfare, as well as search and rescue missions. A crew of two pilots and two naval air crewmen fly the aircraft and are capable of extended overwater operations from numerous Navy ships. The Black Knights of HS-4 are demonstrating the aircraft's rescue capability as they lower Oscar in the rescue collar and then raise him to simulate the recovery of a downed pilot at sea. Oscar is the dummy that they throw overboard from ships, for instance, when they want to do a man overboard drill. And don't worry if they drop him, they got four more. Sobron 4 is, is currently stationed at NAS North Island under the command of Commander Tom Burnson. The Black Knights deploy as a component of CDW-15 on board the USS Carl Vinson CDN-70. The pilots today, Lieutenant Steve Pee Wee Herman and Lieutenant Allen S-10 Saffinfield. The air crewman AW-2 Mars and AW-2 Shermer. Everybody give them a wave. Ah, oh, there they go. By golly, look at that. They bow to you. Isn't that nice? <laughs> oh, those guys do a nice job. That's nice.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, do you really and truly feel a need for speed? All right. As our helicopter is coming back around to land, I want you to notice over in the left side, about a quarter left, is where we see a Tomcat sitting over there. Ladies and gentlemen, now a demonstration by the world's best total fighter, the United States Navy F-14A Tomcat. Designed for the role of fleet air defense, the Tomcat is the most capable fighter weapon system in existence today. Its Hughes AWG-9 weapon control system can detect and track 24 targets simultaneously. It can launch six Phoenix missiles at once and guide each of those missiles to a separate hostile target. The qualities necessary to enable the Tomcat to effectively employ its weapon systems are speed, agility, power, turning ability, acceleration, and climb capability. The F-14A Tomcat has proven to be one of the most effective one-on-one -on -one combat fighters ever produced. In daily training exercises against the free world's best fighters, the F-14A has consistently demonstrated its ability to outperform its opponents. What you will see today is a demonstration of the Tomcat's ability to pursue and outmaneuver a hostile opponent. The aircraft you see today is not a special demonstration aircraft. It's one of many operational fighters flown daily by Fighter Squadron 124, the replacement air group right here at Miramar. Our demonstration pilot is Lieutenant Commander Randy Pogo Clark. Our radar intercept officer is Lieutenant Tom Dog Deppy. VF-124, the gunfighters, is commanded by Commander Jay Akeley, sitting right here and taking notes, and are based right here at NAS Miramar, Fighter Town, USA. The Tomcat is manned by a crew of two, the pilot and the radar intercept officer, or Rio. The pilot flies the airplane, the Rio manages the weapon system, navigation, communications, and electronic warfare equipment. Our Tomcat is now being cleared for takeoff. In just a moment, the crew will run the engines up to 100%, check the instruments and controls, light the afterburners, and commence their takeoff roll. After breaking ground at a minimum airspeed, Lieutenant Commander Clark will use the more than 44,000 pounds of thrust generated by the two Pratt & Whitney TF-30 turbofans to perform the breathtaking dirty roll on takeoff. Tomcat is 62 feet long with a wingspan of 64 feet with the wings full forward. The aircraft basic weight is 42,000 pounds with its internal fuel capacity of 16,200 pounds. Maximum takeoff weight is 35 tons. Lieutenant Commander Clark is now executing a one-half Cuban 8 to reposition over the flight line. pass, our return, our Tomcat will return from the left for a medium speed pass upside down. In the inverted position, the air crew is hanging in their harnesses. All directions and control movements are reversed. Up is down, down is up, left is right, and right is left. Look out to the left at a bare 200 feet above the runway at 360 knots, the inverted flat pass. Just a moment, the aircraft will approach from the right for a plan view pass. Lieutenant Commander Clark will roll the aircraft into a 90 degree angle of bank to show you the delta wing profile of the Tomcat with a wing swept to the full aft position of 68 degrees. It is the variable geometry wing that gives the F-14A the ability to maneuver throughout the envelope. At lower air speeds, the wing is forward. As airspeed increases, the wings move aft. The 
Tomcat is a unique, highly sophisticated aircraft whose operational envelope extends from the deck to 50,000 feet and from zero airspeed to twice the speed of sound. Next, the Tomcat will return from the left at 325 knots and execute a 360-degree level turn to demonstrate its tight turning capability. Notice the wings are fully forward to develop maximum lift. The turn radius will be about one quarter of a mile. Throughout the turn, the air crew will stand six to seven Gs, and the Tomcat will actually accelerate to about 450 knots. Exiting the minimum radius turn, Lieutenant Commander Clark will accelerate and climb to 5,000 feet for the classic split S reversal. Ladies and gentlemen, approaching at 600 knots as the airspeed continues to build, the Tomcat will demonstrate about one-third of its maximum speed capability. As the aircraft accelerates, we want you to watch for four vertical rolls as the F-14 passes and exits to the left. F-14 to 360 knots, about 400 miles per hour. Our VF-124 crew demonstrates the precise roll characteristics of the Tomcat in the four-point roll. All control surfaces come into play in this precision maneuver, not only ailerons, but wing spoilers and tail surfaces as well. The aircraft will roll about the nose-to-tail axis, hesitating momentarily every 90 degrees of the roll. Notice that during the maneuver, the wings will move from the full sweep of 68 degrees to the minimum sweep of 20 degrees. pass will demonstrate the slow flight characteristics of the Tomcat. The aircraft will approach from the left in the landing configuration with its airspeed at approximately 120 knots. The slow speed handling characteristics of the Tomcat are exceptional. Its horizontal tail has about the same surface area as the tail of uh, the wings of an A4 Skyhawk. The F-14A also has two vertical tails instead of the usual one. The large surface area, combined with a tremendous amount of thrust produced by its engines, is especially effective in maneuvering the aircraft at slow speeds. Dog has also informed us now that Pogo has lowered the tail hook. It's the tail hook that you'll find on all Navy aircraft, permitting them to land aboard aircraft carriers and stop in a very exciting 300 feet. Approaching the center point of the air show, which we'll say is the end of our carrier deck, Pogo will take a simulator wave off, go to AB, clean up the aircraft, and climb away from the deck. As he approaches from the left, observe Lieutenant Commander Clark roll the aircraft right to turn left in the tuck under brake.
Pogo now slows the Tomcat down while Dog calls a landing configuration. Wings forward, landing gear down and locked, flaps down, speed brakes out, spoilers arm, brakes pump firm, recheck the gear. The F-14A's final approach speed will be about 110 knots. This slow speed makes it a much safer aircraft than the landing configuration by allowing the pilot more reaction time to control his airspeed and rate of descent. Especially important when landing aboard ship. And just one of the factors that make the F-14 one of the safest tactical aircraft ever deployed. The Navy believes the Tomcat is a superb fighter aircraft. Its sophisticated weapon control system is the result of years of research and development. It can automatically track 24 different targets, launch and control six missiles at six of those targets simultaneously. No other aircraft in the world can do that. Second, its variable geometry wing optimizes lift at every airspeed and altitude, enabling it to outturn almost every frontline fighter in close and air-to-air -air combat. It has four different weapons, the Phoenix missile, the medium-range Sparrow, and the short-range Sidewinder. Additionally, it's equipped with a 20-millimeter cannon with a rate of fire of 6,000 rounds per minute. Fourth, its crew of two has proven to be the best concept for fighters, emphasizing the belief that two sets of eyes are better than one. And finally, the Tomcat can operate effectively and safely from a land base or from an aircraft carrier. From VF-124, the gunfighters, our pilot, Lieutenant Commander Randy Clark, our Rio, Lieutenant Tom Deppy. Let's everybody wave to him now. Everybody, I want to see everybody waving. Let's see if they wave back to us. Look at that. The airplane is bowing to you, and they are waving. Look at it. As our Tomcat is taxiing off to the right side, you remember we launched a bunch of airplanes earlier. We launched uh, an A-4 Skyhawk and an F-5 Tiger from the F-126, the adversary squadron, the bandits here at Miramar. We've also got another Tomcat in the air that hasn't done much since he came by and at Warp 5 earlier in the show today. And what we're going to show you now is a gun and missile tracking demo. You want to call it ACM, air combat maneuvering, that's fine. But these airplanes are out here and they're going to show you what these guys learn at Top Gun. This is the kind of uh, maneuvering and fighting that they go through. And what you're going to see is the Tomcat's going to come in here chasing the A-4. Now this is going to be, uh, you know, he's on the, on the tail of a, of a bandit and the idea is to get him in the sight, squeeze one off and smoke him. But of course, uh, what we're going to do is make things a little tougher on him by, uh, we're going to surprise him by putting another bandit on his tail. So it's going to be kind of an interesting uh, bunch of maneuvering we're going to be watching out here in just a moment. Got him in the sights. Got him in the sights. a force turning inside. Stay inside him. Got to stay inside him. Start that turn. Keep him in his... Holy cow, look at that. Tighten it up. Tighten it up, Hoops. Coming right. Coming right. About another 30 seconds. Keep him inside. Got to keep him inside. Man is coming around to the right side. Stay on top of him. Stay inside him. Stay inside him. Pull him around. He's coming back to the right. Stay inside him. That's all we got. Pull hard. There's a grunt right there. Seven G's in the turn. Pull. All right. Hit the burners. We got it. We're going to nail him this time. Guy's breaking right. Stay inside him. Coming back and forth. Breaking right. Come up. Pull. Come on up. Chainsaw in the back seat right now saying, hey, whoop, we got somebody behind us. We got somebody behind us. Forget the guy in front of us. We got somebody behind us. He's humming us. Get around him. Get around him. All the way up over the top. Look at that. He's going to overshoot. Good. Pull down behind him. Holy cow, we got him in the sights. Squeeze one off. Now pull, pull, pull. Guns. Take him. Good morning, Mr. Gaddafi. This is your wake-up call. Town USA Air Show 87, Miramar NAS. We're here with the A4 Skyhawk, uh, 126 Aggressor Squadron, Lieutenant Casey Gagan, Animal Gagan. Tell us about that handle. Animal came back in uh, San Antonio about 1981, and that's probably about all I can say about that, but it's an uh, inappropriate call sign for the events that occurred. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shucks. That's all we're going to hear. Well, for now, it's, uh, I said, I can tell you where it happened and, uh, and the year it happened, but the hows and whys get a little detailed and uh, 
since we have a lot of people watching here, it uh, might be better if I just let you know that. Classified information. Tell us about the 126. What's your job? 126, we do uh, adversary training for the uh, Pacific Fleet. What that means, we're the bad guys. We fly uh, Soviet or Third World tactics against the uh, F-14 guys, the F-18 guys, the Marine Corps, against anybody, and we fly tactics in which they might encounter in uh, different parts of the world. And We try to uh, simulate with our different airplanes the MiG series aircraft, and uh, we try to get down and dirty and, like I said, be the bad guys. And hopefully uh, the fighter town guys from here at Miramar beat us every day. And if they can't do that, then they're doing their job. But if uh, we happen to sneak up behind them and uh, shoot them a few times, then they know they have some work to do. So we just try to keep them sharp on their uh, air combat skills. Okay, that's your job. How well, uh, how well do you succeed at it? And we uh, give the guys here at Miramar a good run for their money. They have uh, the faster airplanes, the better radar, the better weapon system. So uh, we try to sneak and uh, use a little extra airplanes. If they have uh, two Tomcats up, we might take uh, six or eight of these A4 or F5 airplanes out and uh, have a couple come real high, a couple come real low, and try to get in there unseen and get a shot off. So what we try to tell these guys to do is keep a lookout for other airplanes because in the real world, that's what you're going to see is uh, airplanes, uh, the guy that you don't see is going to be the guy that shoots you down. And the A4 and the F5 both do a, a decent job then of simulating the uh, adversary aircraft. They do a great job, as a matter of fact. We also recently picked up the, uh, the F-16, which simulates a, uh, a new uh, Soviet threat. So that will give the, uh, the guys that fly a Tomcat and the F-18 and the other um, and the Marine Corps fighters a uh, tougher time, so they have to really improve on their tactics. But uh, our pilots, we uh, try to train to uh, fly these tactics the best we can so that when we're out in the F-5 or the A-4, we can give them a good run for their money. And when you're working with the fleet guys, do they know uh, what aircraft you're coming after them with? They have a general idea as far as uh, what might be out there, but we have a, uh, a scenario called uh, a 2V unknown, which two F-14s will be up against an unknown number of bogeys, an unknown kind of aircraft. So they know that we're out there somewhere, they don't know how many, what kind of airplane, they have a general idea. So when they see the airplane, they have to go right to a game plan as far as what kind of tactics they want to fly. So it's a split second kind of reaction. They say, there's an A-4, I got to fight him this way. There's an F-5, I have to fight him differently. So we have to do a split second. At the same time, we're sneaking up from behind him trying to get a shot off. So they really have to uh, have a good game plan set. 126 doing a good job. Thank you, Animal. Sure, take care. Bye.
Town, USA, Top Gun Air Show, Miramar NAS 87. We're here with this mean-looking SR-71, and we're here with Major Ed Yielding, who is the pilot of this airplane. Ed, tell us how it is to fly an SR-71. Oh, I really love flying the airplane. Uh, <clears throat> I've got about 600 hours in it now and get a lot of satisfaction out of flying the missions. Uh, we cruise normally about 80,000 feet plus, uh, three times the speed of sound plus. At, uh, at that altitude, you can just see the curvature of the Earth. Overhead, it's uh, real dark, not, not a, quite black yet, but it's a real dark blue. You can see for hundreds of miles. Uh, down toward the horizon, you see a bright band of blue near the horizon. And uh, we're flying uh, above any weather, above the jet stream. Uh, so there's no wind and no turbulence. It's a real smooth ride up there. And we go to some pretty interesting places, so I get a lot of satisfaction out of flying the mission. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking to a man here that enjoys going to work. There's no question about that. What's the maximum capability of the airplane? How high have you flown it? Okay, we're supposed to say 80,000 feet plus, and uh, Mach 3 plus is our speed. And we regularly operate at that uh, speed and altitude because the aircraft is more efficient at that, at that high speed. Uh, at the uh, higher speeds, some of the air is actually vented around the engine and directly into the afterburner, giving a ramjet effect. And so with the ramjet effect, we're more efficient and get more miles per gallon at that uh, higher speed. You're actually beginning to burn air, right? That's, that's correct. We depend on air for combustion and also for lift. What's the longest mission that you've flown? Okay, uh, typical missions are two to four hours, and the missions can be much longer than that. I have flown some that are much longer than that. And with air refueling, essentially our mission uh, length can be uh, unlimited. Uh, so essentially we can cover anywhere that they really need us to, to get to. How many SR-71s are in service? Okay, the numbers uh, actually classified. Uh, there are not, uh, not many. Uh, the number of crews is not classified. It varies from 10 to 13, so that gives you a rough idea. We're all permanently based at Beale Air Force Base in near Sacramento, California, and we're sent uh, temporary duty to uh, Okinawa and also Mildenhall, England. What else would you like to tell our viewers about this mean machine? Well, again, I really love flying the airplane and uh, especially enjoy being here at uh, Miramar today. I believe this is our first trip to uh, Miramar. It's been a great air show and uh, really has been an honor to be here and I've really enjoyed talking to all the people. Thank you, Major Ed Yielding. Thank you. Thanks for having us here. You betcha. This is the McDonnell Douglas F.A. 18 Hornet, the most versatile tactical aircraft in the world today. A fighter interceptor, a close-in fighter, an all-weather day-night attack aircraft, a close air support aircraft, and a reconnaissance aircraft. A tremendous capability in one airframe. It may seem that this is far too big a job, too complex to expect from an aircraft of the Hornet's size. But we at McDonnell Douglas have combined the latest technology and turned it into capability. The capability to fight and win. The Hornet is the result of combining state-of-the-art technology in electronics, computerization, composite materials, and combining all of these advanced technologies into one outstanding aircraft. Advanced aerodynamic research led to the Hornet's wing design. This design has leading edge extensions that greatly improve the high angle of attack characteristics of the aircraft. The GE F404 low bypass engine was developed exclusively for the Hornet and is truly an outstanding performer. The F404 engine is in the same thrust class as the renowned J79 engine, and yet the F404 is smaller, more compact, weighs only half as much, and contains 7,700 fewer parts. 
The Hornet's twin engines generate 7,200 kilograms of thrust, a thrust greater than its own total fighting weight. Idle to full afterburner is attained in only three seconds throughout the flight envelope. For extended range or patrol time, the Hornet can be refueled in flight. The Hornet is an airborne arsenal. It can carry 7,700 kilograms of armament in the attack mission. In the fighter role, it carries two fuselage-mounted radar-guided missiles, wingtip-mounted heat-seeking missiles, with the capability of adding four additional missiles under the wings. And it has its internal 20-millimeter Vulcan cannon with 570 rounds of ammunition. The Hornet was designed from the beginning to fulfill dual missions. It was designed to serve as a superior air-to-air -air fighter and a deadly air-to-surface attack aircraft. It not only fulfills both missions extremely well, but excels in both. And what makes it so superior? The heart of the Hornet. The major factor that makes it so unique and versatile, its futuristic cockpit. Human engineering specialists have constructed a multi-mission cruise station that is right out of Star Wars. The pilot is at the center of a computer-driven information center. Gone are most of the dials, knobs, and toggle switches of yesterday's aircraft. These have been replaced by two computers connected to three cathode ray tubes. Voice alerts and hands-on throttle and stick controls allow single pilot ease of operation. Surrounding the cathode ray tubes used for control of the sensors, weapons, and radar are 20 push-button optional mode controls which can call up and display any required data. One of the major reasons that the Hornet is so versatile is its all-digital, multi-mission APG-65 radar designed and built by Hughes Aircraft. It's a marvel in its own right, with unparalleled flexibility and a wide range of operating modes for both fighter and attack missions, including a high degree of resolution never before found in fighter aircraft. Additionally, the radar can track up to 10 targets at the same time while maintaining surveillance in the area being scanned and can detect individual targets in a cluster formation. Capping the versatility of the cockpit is an advanced heads-up display, which is the primary flight status display. Positioned in the pilot's forward field of view, it displays airspeed, attitude, angle of attack, altitude, heading, Mach number, G loading and destination heading. Also displayed during combat are aiming reticles, target designators, bomb fall lines, search circles, lock on, range, and number of weapons remaining. The F 18's quad redundant flight control fly by wire system gives the aircraft a safe, sure response for any maneuvers at all air speeds and altitudes. The surfaces are no longer dependent upon rods, wires, and pulleys to move them. A manual backup control system is provided should major battle damage disable the primary flight control system. From the initial concept of the FA-18 Hornet, reliability and maintainability have been stressed to assure that all aspects of the aircraft meet or exceed program guarantees. McDonnell Douglas has changed the traditional maintenance concept. For example, an entire engine has been removed, replaced, and hooked up in less than 21 minutes. Subsystem components are located at chest level along the fuselage for easy access. Built-in monitor codes show the status of all consumables. Our avionics fault tree analyzer eliminates the need for expensive avionics test equipment and reduces the technical manpower required to maintain the aircraft. In short, the ideal multi-mission aircraft. That's why the United States Navy, Marine Corps, Canada, Spain, and Australia have selected the F-A-18 as their first line of defense. The F-A-18 Hornet aircraft, which will serve the free world well into the 21st century.
Watertown USA Air Show 87, NAS Miramar. We're here with Dave Shin, whose handle is rotor, and we're with the F-18 Hornet. Yes, sir. Tell us about the F-18, Dave. That's the newest strike fighter in the uh, naval uh, inventory. I uh, currently have about uh, six operational squadrons on the uh, west coast here right now. Now, we're hearing an awful lot about the F-14 Top Gun fighter here at this show, all kinds of specs and everything, but yet uh, we hear the phrase Advantage Hornet. Tell us. It depends whose fight you're going to fight. If we go out and fight an F-14 uh, in his fight, he's, uh, he's probably going to win. If we can get him down to fight our fight, then uh, we're going to win. Explain the difference. What's his fight and what's yours? He's going to work a lot faster. He's going to be a little more capable at the uh, long range shot. Uh, we have a better turn rate, uh, thrust to weight ratio. We're going to try and uh, draw him down into a turn fight and uh, get behind him. Okay, so close in, uh, you're on top. Uh, far out, a little more technical battle, he might be on top. That's right. What's your personal opinion on the airplane and what's your history? How do you come to it? I am a uh, used to be a warrant officer in the Army, flew helos for two years, uh, A-7 background, training command, uh, Kitty Hawk tour and a strike ops job, and then uh, to the F-18 Hornet. And the plane is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the best plane the Navy's got today. Where's the F-15 fit in? Well, that's an Air Force uh, fighter. It's uh, not capable of coming aboard the ship. Uh, neither is the F-16. I think if we... Uh, now look at capability and where we can put an aircraft carrier. What we're going to be looking at is uh, F-14s and F-18s doing the fighting. Have you uh, had an opportunity to fly the F-14 rotor? No, sir. Never have. So all of this is uh, uh, theoretical at this point. That's right. My feelings and just uh, what we've done fighting against the F-14. Anything else you'd like to tell our viewers about the airplane? Well, the uh, F-18, uh, like I say, it is the newest aircraft in the fleet. It's, uh, it's an awful lot of fun to fly. Uh, it's a goal that I think... Uh, Every young person should uh, strive to, uh, to get to. F-14s, F-18s, Naval Air is, is the way to go today. Thank you, Rotor. Appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the show. We did. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, the next voice you hear will be that of the narrator for the Holy Ghost from Colorado, California. Lieutenant Cliff Red Skelton. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Your United States Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron takes pleasure in performing for you this, our 40th flight demonstration of the 1987 season. Since 1946, the Blue Angels have had the rare privilege of demonstrating to the American public the precision techniques of naval aviation, hoping to inspire our young men and women to pursue careers in the United States Navy and Marine Corps. The maneuvers you will see demonstrated here this afternoon are coordinated tactical techniques developed by Navy and Marine pilots, both in peacetime training and actual combat. These maneuvers are neither stunts nor daring feats, but refinements of basic techniques taught to every prospective naval aviator. Here at the Naval Air Station Miramar, we will be demonstrating these maneuvers at a very low altitude, in traditional Blue Angel formation, so that you may see and take pride in the precise fashion in which your Navy and Marine Corps pilots are trained to fly. Ladies and gentlemen, Flying Blue Angel number one, the commanding officer and flight leader of the Blue Angels from Portland, North Dakota, Commander Gil Rude. Flying Blue Angel number two, the right wingman, our Marine Corps representative from Saverna Park, Maryland, Captain Mark Bircher. Flying Blue Angel number three, the left wingman, formerly of the Black Lions of Fighter Squadron 213, Lieutenant Commander Donnie Cochran. And flying Blue Angel number four, the slot pilot from Dallas, Texas, Lieutenant Commander Pat Walsh. Flying Blue Angel number five, the lead solo from Savannah, Georgia, Lieutenant Commander David Anderson. And flying Blue Angel number six, the opposing solo, formerly of BF-2 here at Naval Air Station Miramar, Lieutenant Wayne Mulner. Ladies and gentlemen, the Blue Angels would like to dedicate our performance this afternoon to the memory of a friend and former naval aviator, a former San Diego resident, Lieutenant Steve Moreau lost his life Friday while flying his A-4 Skyhawk from the Naval Air Station Lemoore, California. They're on the runway now, established in that fingertip formation. They'll accelerate their engines to 85% power, carefully check their engine instruments, and respond to Commander Rude with a thumbs up, indicating they're ready to go. With a thumbs up from each of his wingmen, Commander Rude will call smoke on, off brakes, burners on, and the Blue Angel Diamond will be rolling. 
He will accelerate to 150 miles per hour and pull back on the stick to fly the formation into the air. Let's watch as Lieutenant Commander Walsh makes his move to the slot, establishing that diamond formation. Once established in the slot, he'll call for the landing gear and the flaps to come up, and they'll commence their diamond burner loop on takeoff. From the right, the Blue Angel Diamond is rolling. As they pass before us, you will notice the smoke is not visible while the aircraft are in afterburner. of the afterburner by the four diamond pilots. As the airspeed increases, the pilots experience four times the pull of gravity required to round out the backside of this looping maneuver. To the right, Blue Angel number five is rolling. He will accelerate to 170 miles per hour and climb to an altitude of 50 feet. He will then roll his aircraft 360 degrees with the landing gear extended. The dirty roll on takeoff. Back to the right once more, Blue Angel number six is rolling. He will execute a very low, precise transition and a low altitude aileron roll. You will notice he's airborne now, retracting the landing gear. He rolls his aircraft 360 degrees and continues to accelerate to 300 miles per hour. Pulling back on the stick, he climbs straight up into the vertical. Let's watch as he moves over the top at an altitude of 3,000 feet and an airspeed of 150 miles per hour. On his back now, completing the one-half Cuban 8 on takeoff, Lieutenant Muller will pass before us and exit the flight line to the right. Edge pass. The diamond is approaching for a maneuver I'm sure is familiar to many of you who might have seen the Blue Angels perform in the past. From the right, at 400 miles per hour, the diamond roll. All four aircraft rolling as one in this graceful 360 degree rolling maneuver.
Navy Marine pilots who must land their aircraft on the small and sometimes pitching deck of an aircraft carrier at sea. Slow speed flight is just as important as high speed flight. In order to demonstrate the slow speed handling characteristics of these F-18s, Commander Root has called for the extension of the landing gear and the hooks as they perform a maneuver attempted by no other jet flight demonstration team in the world today. From the left, the Diamond Dirty Loop. Lieutenant Molnar from the right, and Lieutenant Commander Anderson from behind the spectator area. Let's watch as Lieutenant Molnar performs a maximum performance, minimum radius, afterburner turn. And Lieutenant Commander Anderson climbs straight up into the vertical to demonstrate the vertical climb and roll capabilities of these F-18s. Diamond pilots are now shifting to a left echelon formation. At 400 miles per hour, watch carefully as they perform their most difficult echelon rolling maneuver. Now, Commander Rood will commence a 360 degree roll into his three wingmen, demonstrating the left echelon roll. This is a particularly difficult maneuver, especially for Lieutenant Commander Pat Walsh in Blue Angel number four. into the traditional Blue Angel Diamond. Aircraft pilots and enthusiasts who understand the difficult transition from the cruise to the landing configuration will appreciate this next maneuver demonstrated by our two solo pilots. To the left, Lieutenant Commander Anderson and Lieutenant Mulner have established a mirror image formation. But look carefully, for both aircraft are in the carrier landing configuration as they approach for a maneuver we call the Fortis. The four Diamond pilots are approaching the flight line once again from the right. This time, however, you should notice two significant modifications. While Blue Angels 2 and 3 still maintain that minimum wingtip to canopy separation, the flight leader and slot pilot are both upside down. The Blue Angel Double Parvel 1987. In the spectator area, Blue Angels 5 and 6 are approaching the flight line in a line abreast formation at 400 miles per hour. Approaching center point, they will perform a maneuver to demonstrate the turn radius of these F-18s. The opposing minimum radius turn. Watch as both pilots now sustain six times the pull of gravity required to cross their aircraft directly over center point. From 
the right at 350 miles per hour. The Blue Angel Echelon Parade. Ladies and gentlemen, directly before you, the Tuckaway Cross. Pilots are still maintaining that right echelon formation. Approaching center point, Commander Rood will commence a climb in a 360 degree rolling maneuver. After 270 degrees of roll, they will smoothly shift the formation back into the traditional Blue Angel Diamond. This is a changeover roll, a precise transition from echelon against the beautiful California sky. to the difficult line abreast formation. Approaching center point, they will climb straight up into the vertical, experiencing heavy G as the airspeed dissipates. Still maintaining minimum separation, the pilots must now align themselves by looking 90 degrees from their flight path toward Commander Rude's aircraft. Power is eased as the aircraft round out the backside of this five plane line abreast loop. Another formation change prior to detaching Blue Angel number five. Let's watch as Lieutenant Commander Anderson executes a split S reversal turn back toward the flight line. He's setting up for his solo maneuver, the horizontal rolls. <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Anderson will perform a series of maximum stick deflection horizontal rolls. straight up into the vertical, reaching 90 degrees nose up. The diamond will split, all four aircraft exiting in separate directions. Ladies and gentlemen, the Blue Angel, vertical break.
Giroud is rolling out the diamond for the Blue Angel, low straight cross. Approaching center point, each pilot will perform an individual brake turn and exit the flight line in a separate direction. Now, let's watch as Commander Ruth calls. Ready, break. Pilot will now accelerate his aircraft to 500 miles per hour and execute an individual reversal turn back toward the flight line. On the right, at 400 miles per hour, the Delta roll. All five wingmen maintaining position on the leader as they roll 360 degrees over center point. On the left, at 450 miles per hour, the Blue Angel, Fleur de Lis. Solo pilots are rejoining the diamond for another delta maneuver. Let's watch this next reversal executed by the Blue Angel leader. Contrast this steep reversal with the shallow reversal seen earlier. Commander Rood rolls the formation onto its back and pulls the nose well below the horizon to roll out on the flight line here at Miramar for their next maneuver, the Delta Loop Break. his aircraft to 500 miles per hour and execute a one-half Cuban 8 reversal turn back toward the flight line. As they go up and over the top, you should be able to follow the individual smoke trails as all six pilots simultaneously roll their aircraft 180 degrees so as to be headed back toward the center point. Now watch its next maneuver carefully from six different directions with maximum speed and minimum separation. They'll converge on center point and cross with a combined closure rate of nearly 1,000 miles per hour. Lieutenant 
United States Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron represents a time-honored tradition of pride, professionalism, and excellence, spanning 76 years of naval aviation. The 1987 team takes a great deal of pride in saluting Navy and Marine pilots, maintenance crews, and support personnel everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, flying Blue Angel number six, the opposing Colt Solo and formerly of the Founding Hunters of Fighter Squadron 2 here at the Naval Air Station Miramar, Lieutenant Wayne Molnar. Flying Blue Angel number five, the lead Solo from Savannah, Georgia, Lieutenant Commander David Anderson. Line Blue Angel number four, the slot pilot from Dallas, Texas, Lieutenant Commander Pat Walsh. Line Blue Angel number three, the left wingman and formerly of the Black Lions of Fighter Squadron 213 here at Miramar, Lieutenant Commander Donnie Cochran. Line Blue Angel number two, the right wingman, our Marine Corps representative from Saverna Park, Maryland, Captain Mark Bircher. Flying Blue Angel number one, the commanding officer and flight leader of the Blue Angels from Portland, North Dakota, Commander Gil Rude. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, representing your United States Navy and Marine Corps, the Blue Angels, 1987. Ladies and gentlemen, the narrator for the Blue Angels from Coronado, California, Lieutenant Cliff Skelton. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your attention today. We hope you've enjoyed the air show. And once again, uh, we're going to urge you that the early arrivals who obviously got the places up near the fence not to go dashing off, we'd like you to stay here and to look around and see what we have. We've got all these static displays. We've got a lot of food. I just had an, a, a Polish sausage that I'm going to remember for a, probably about three days. It's all delicious food. 
We want you to enjoy yourself. We don't want you to hustle off. And the Blue Angels will be coming to the line to sign autographs in the next few minutes. On behalf of all the folks who have been working for a year to put this show on, and on behalf of all the folks who the day after tomorrow begin working on putting a show together for 1988, I want to thank you very, very much for coming. My name is Frank Kingston Smith from Boston, Massachusetts. It has been my pleasure to perform at my first air show in the state of California, let alone here at Miramar in San Diego. I have been asked back for next year, and I will be back. Thank you very, very much. You have been an absolute delight to work for. We'll see you next year. Thank you.